That is also, in my mind, a desperation move um, to produce more and more coal at cheaper and cheaper prices to stay on top. So you have deep water drilling, hydraulic fracturing, these horrific techniques uh, to harvest coal. And you wonder why this is happening. And I, I think it's happening, especially in the case of hydraulic fracturing, as competition for the future, which could come now in terms of renewable energy and innovation. And as a, as a kind of um, a, a, a tactic to keep themselves in control for another 50, 60, 100 years, whatever it is. Now the last, I mean, everything in this room was built by fossil fuels. And thank God, you know, because it, it brought humanity to a completely other place. But in the next 100 years, is also built by fossil fuels. We will be, we will be dismantling that. Piece by piece. You have to make this transition. You have to change to renewable energy. You have to do it very, very quickly. Because what developing all this fossil this natural gas means, and what they would like to do is put it in cars and convert our entire power generation system to natural gas. Mm. That would be a, for the power system alone, it's a seven hundred billion dollar build out. Three hundred fifty billion dollars for pipelines, three hundred fifty billion dollars for power plants. And the pipelines are snaking through everybody's backyard and they're remaining this way and that. And then, of course, after you've spent that $700 billion, um, you made all that infrastructure and turned the whole country upside down, according to the plan that they would like to implement. Remember, 130 to 180,000 gas wells in Pennsylvania. Like you run out of gas. You gotta figure out what, what, what else to do. Now, I'm not suggesting this huge power plant, like huge wind farms everywhere, these huge, um, Big industrial renewable projects are the answer. Um, I was at a debate in Maryland recently, and this one guy got up and he said, Do you know how many acres it would take to replace Marcel Shale and solar panels? And I didn't know. And he said, Some big number. And he walked off sort of triumphantly. And I said, Well, we have those acres, they're called rooftops. <laughs> and, you know, and he was. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the audience reacted just like that too. And and um, so there's a time when you, when all these readily acceptable, palatable positions that you see on television, and you see it on the media, and you hear from politicians are comp are just totally unacceptable. And you have to move in the direction of of innovation. And you have to find where it is, and you have to fund it, and you have to make it happen. And we're in a very severe economic fix in America right now. And I can think of really good ways of converting buildings um, and converting individual homes <laughs> to renewable energy that would revolutionize not only the way we get energy and all these other things, but the economy itself. Um, so what happened here with this weird letter uh, that came to my backyard, not that far, out of back court, and then this film that was made by like four people, myself, the editor, Sanchez, two producers, uh, working on our spare time, who sort of stumbled onto the huge big fight and the root of everything um, to convert from these fossil fuels to another era of uh, energy production all across the planet. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because it's it's one of those big struggles. It's like one of those like you know, uh, women get the vote, uh, black people and white people can coexist kind of issues. It's, one, it's, it's a revolution, and, I mean, you know, a nonviolent revolution, I would never and not advocate that. But it is that kind of paradigm shift, and the only way that that gets <coughs> done, historically, is when you have people take to the streets, and you have civil disobedience, and you have that kind of action taking place, um, and it involves everybody at a participatory level. And I know that Swarthmore itself doesn't get its water from the Delaware River. But Philadelphia does. Mm -hmm. So it means it's the water supply for your neighbor, direct neighbor. And I do know that there was a proposal to process hydraulic fracture waste nearby and it was shut down. Um, isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. You know, and that's great. 
fracking proposal is not going away. We're headed in exactly the wrong direction. And Tom, Tom Corbett should hear from a lot of people when a film that was nominated for an Oscar and vetted in all these sources, and there was a huge New York Times expose th three weeks ago to confirm all these facts, should not be calling, should not allow the person who heads the geology department to be throwing the N word around. He should be fired. You know? And they should also hear that the Delaware River Basin Commission from this group of people saying, absolutely no way you should be doing fracking at the Delaware River Basin. Because the Delaware River Basin Commission just put out the lights. <laughs> <laughs> just put out. They just put out. It was your fault. You're leaning against the light switch, aren't you? That's her. Where did you come from? Are you with the Department of Homeland Security? <laughs> Who was becoming 
become involved because he lives on the New York side of the Delaware. And um, I, I met him at Sundance. He had two films at Sundance. We became good friends and we were doing a lot of work together. Mark Ruffalo was asked by GQ magazine if he was on a terror watch list. And his response was pretty fucking funny. That end quote. <laughs> and and articulate as always, Mark. And so it was over Thanksgiving weekend, and it ran on a celebrity blog at like Thursday morning at like 9 a.m. And of course, it's Thanksgiving weekend, so all the journalists are away except the celebrity bloggers. And by Monday morning, oh God. it had hit like, you know, millions of people on thousands of celebrity blogs because it just replicated over the whole weekend while nobody was paying attention. To it. And then all of a sudden it becomes Mark Ruffalo, terror watch list, you know, and he went on Rachel Maddow to talk about it or something like this. <laughs> um, but what's really scary about this is not, I mean, who knows if Mark Ruffalo was on terror watch. He was certainly flying at the, you know, around. Um, Ed Rendell came out and he said that he was embarrassed. He didn't apologize, he said he was embarrassed. It was, it was a little different. Um, but the long and short of it is, that there is this very real intimidation going on mm -hmm. when you have capital oil and gas accompanied by armed guards coming into people's homes to do the water testing, when you have public meetings where you have armed guards, where you have landmen who get who lose their charm after the third visit and say things like, well, we're going to stick the well up here. And that sort of thing is going on. And it has a chilling effect on organizing. Um, if you're all of a sudden worried about being on a terrorism watch list. I mean, we we sent around our mailing list during these events, and people may have gotten freaked out that they would have grabbed the list, you know, or copied it or something. They didn't pass the whole thing back. <laughs> and, that, and so this intimidation um, is very, very real. And then you have the Northern Wayne Property Owners Alliance, which is Wayne County's property owners group that wants to lease, that has at least 80,000 acres in the watershed, um, distributed an email about myself and my friends who are in Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, the, the activist group there, um, describing us as terroristic folks. So when you go to the general store in Monteville, and everybody knows who I am now, you wonder, do half of these people here think I'm a terrorist? And this is the kind of effect that this has. And this is why it's so important 